And thank you all for being here. My name is Musho. I'm one of the many senior students of the Village Zendo. And I also lead the Catskill Zen Circle here in Catskill, New York, where I live. My talk tonight is about non-duality. And I would say that war is the exact opposite of non-duality. It takes a lot of duality to fire a missile into a populated city. The unnecessary suffering that the Ukrainian people are facing is horrible. And the decisions of the Russian leadership, the decisions that they've made seem to me to be motivated by greed and anger and a deep belief in us versus them. I listened to a speech that President Zelensky directed at the Russian people uh, actually, a speech you can watch on YouTube. It's it's easy to find. He was talking directly to the to the Russian people, and reading the subtitles and hearing his voice, I felt that he was trying to appeal to the similarities of Russian and Ukrainian people, to their common ancestors, their family, and their friends in both countries, and a common desire for peace, justice, and human rights. It was really beautiful. To me, he was talking about the underlying subtle unity between Russian and Ukraine, Russia and Ukraine, a subtle unity that nationalistic forces try to break down. Our Zen Dharma says a subtle unity exists between all of us and all things. So many of us are feeling a deep compassion for our Ukrainian brothers and sisters, and we should support them any way we can. I used to live in the East Village, and it was a Ukrainian neighborhood with some great Ukrainian restaurants, and it was lovely and I miss it. Our Zen practice is also asking us to feel a deep compassion for the Russian leadership as well. A compassion for their anger and their complete separation from the subtle unity that pervades everywhere. It's a lot harder to do, to look at their side and feel non-separation from them. Meditation is the place where we can experience non-duality. And my way of seeing it is that non-duality is simply the process of getting it together. Uh, I live here in the small town of Catskill. It's about two and a half hours from New York City. It sits on the banks of the Hudson River. And running our, through our town is a creek. And uh, where the creek comes through the town and meets the Hudson River, it's, it's more of a river uh, than a creek. It's quite wide. And it, almost every morning, I walk my, my dog down there, I walk my dog down there to look at the creek. And last week, or actually a couple of weeks ago now, the creek was heaped with chunks of gray ice. And it was a chaotic mess of shards and upended slabs uh, with broken branches and tree stumps. It was really pretty incredible. And as I stood there pondering the creek um, in a form that I've never seen, wondering how those ice chunks got there and how they got broken and the whole thing, I, I got a little lost in that. And as I stood there, Suddenly the wind blew and I could feel the icy cold going right through my jacket. At that moment, there was really no separation between me and the winter. 
when I got to our meditation group that morning and I sat down and thought about it, I thought about the feeling of the icy wind. It wasn't imaginary. <laughs> and although I didn't like it, it was winter just being winter and me perceiving it as winter, just winter as winter is and my perception as my perception is. I have to add that comparing the suffering and trauma of the world to the wind blowing through the jacket of a very entitled white middle-aged man one morning is trivial, but so it is. The whole episode, of course, reminded me of a koan, case 27 from the Blue Cliff Record. A monk asks Yun Men, how is it when the tree withers and the leaves fall? Yun Men said, body exposed in the golden wind. It's so beautiful and it's, it stayed with me for a long time. Some of my Dharma brothers and sisters have talked about this koan. Zen is focused on reality the reality that everything eventually comes to an end. When we see, hear, and feel this clearly and deeply, even for a moment, the golden wind blows and the body is exposed. The body is not separate from the wind. Yun Men just wants the monk and you and I to get it together. I love the question of the monk. How is it when the tree withers and the leaves fall? In my own way, I was thinking, how is it when death and old age are nearby? How is it when one's hair turns gray? How is it when the freezing wind blows through the jacket? How is it? Young men wants us to get it together and experience reality fully, fully exposed reality. It's harsh, but also beautiful. And I think that's why he calls the wind golden. How beautiful and harsh to experience reality. I'm pondering the icy river and suddenly I notice the wind blowing through my jacket. How is it? I have a body. I'm here and I'm alive. I'm cold and I can feel it. Young men, wants us to feel the wind at least once or every time it blows or all the time. He wants us to realize we are not separate from the withered tree. He wants us to get it together. Spring and winter are very different and you could call them opposites. But I think what our practice is asking us is to realize our experience of spring and winter and how we are related and connected to spring and winter and related and connected to everything without exception. Buddhism teaches the wonderful concept of non-duality. It's a wide, profound topic of study with many books, essays and teachings by brilliant people But I think it's safe to say simply that non-duality depends on duality, as dark depends on light, as happiness depends on sadness, and spring depends on winter. Form depends on emptiness, and emptiness depends on form. You can't have one of these things without the other. Our minds are naturally looking for differences in things. And to survive, we have to know the difference between a tiger and a zebra, for example. That's pretty obvious. But we also need to be able to figure out the difference between a poisonous mushroom and one that is good to eat, which isn't very obvious. In a Buddhist way, you could say that all forms are dualist, dualistic, that a chair is here and that over there is not a chair. There is winter 
and there is spring. The problem that Yun Men and all the Buddhas and Buddha ancestors are trying to address is the problem of a perceived duality between the self and everything else. There's me here, and over there is a big, scary world. Letting go of this elemental delusion is, as Ryotan Roshi expressed in his talk last week, the whole ball game. I see an urgency to this, the separation that we feel between each other and the world around us causes untold suffering. It's not just about empathy. It's about a radical understanding that all our actions, our words, our habits, our thoughts, are not just changing the world, um, but actually creating it. There is an old cartoon, probably from the New Yorker magazine, that you've probably all seen, where a Buddhist monk is buying a hot dog at a stand and says to the vendor, make me one with everything. It's still kind of funny. <laughs> anyway, I like it and I think it's funny because it breaks the seriousness of spiritual pursuits, but it also contains a bit of longing that maybe we all want to somehow understand this and be one with everything. For Zen practitioners, this cartoon is probably ironic on another level because after years of meditation and studying the teachings, we still have to struggle every day to become one. If only our teachers could instantly make us one with everything. It's not that they're not trying. <laughs> Thank you, teachers. <laughs> I think Yun Men would have liked this cartoon because what could be more non-dualistic than a hot dog loaded with ketchup and mustard and onions and pickles eaten while standing on the street in the middle of the busy city? What could possibly more be more real than that? In another koan, uh, Yun Men is back in case 77, and he says, well, a monk asks Yun Men, what is talk that goes beyond Buddhas and patriarchs? Yun Men said, cake. Maybe if he lived now, he might have said hot dog. The hot dog is real. The wind blowing through the jacket is real. What happened in the market in Wuhan, China is real. Floods, fires, and storms caused by climate change are real. The anger of truck drivers in Canada, the Russian tanks rolling into Ukraine. We are all part of this reality. Everyone is involved and no one is separate. We are involved and we're responsible for the reality around us, the suffering and the beauty. There just isn't any separation. When the monk asked, what is talk that goes beyond Buddhas and patriarchs? There are many dualities in his question. What is talk? And what is beyond talk? What is Buddhas and patriarchs? And what is beyond Buddhas and patriarchs? And he doesn't even mention matriarchs. What about what's beyond matriarchs? There's so many different things. I think this is why Yun Man answers cake. He's trying to give the monk a chance to get it together. According to um, the biographical information in the Blue Cliff Record, in the end of the book, there's a lot of great stuff if you're working on that book. Uh, it says that Yun Men died in the year 949. I've done the math on this. That's 1,072 years ago. And I feel like we don't seem to be listening. We either endlessly ignore that the golden wind blows and the body is exposed, or we're so endlessly terrified that the tree withers and the leaves fall. There's so much needless suffering from all this, panic and denial. 
pretending and hoping. Yunmin may be dead, but his words are still sitting in the middle of it all, his body exposed by the golden wind. Maybe if Yunmen could see what has happened in the last 1,072 years, he would still have some hope. Why? Because look, here we are, students and teachers of Zen, sitting in the middle of the golden wind, sitting together, striving to get it together, taking time to look at the nature of our thoughts and becoming one with our feelings and our interconnectedness with each other. It's beautiful. In Zen temples, there's a monitor seat and the monitor watches over the meditators to ensure their well-being. Over the years, I've had the great privilege to sit as the monitor. And when I see the Sangha shuffling in and getting settled and attending to the silence, I always feel emotional. It's joy, really, to see people who care so deeply for themselves and our world. Deep enough to sit for hours, days, months, years, just trying to get it together. The Village Zendo's annual Shuso Hosen ceremony will happen in a few weeks. If you don't know about it, it's a ritual where a dedicated Sangha member becomes a senior student. Congratulations to Michael Hongo Brooks. I see you out there, Hongo, somewhere. Thank you for your practice. What a great guy and a great leader of our group. During my own Shuso time, I was lucky to preside over the Zendo the Zendo's first winter retreat at the Garrison Institute with its huge meditation hall. There was no COVID and I was able to watch over 90 people sitting in silence and getting it together. It was so beautiful, beautiful and dramatic. But as dramatic as it was, I feel the same way when I see two or three shuffling in from the cold into our little storefront temple here in Catskill. Maybe Yun Men would be just as proud and grateful as I am that we receive and maintain this practice. It's wonderful. Thank you all for sitting Zazen in the golden wind. Thank you for continuing to see the falling leaves and the withering tree. We do the work of Buddha's patriarchs and matriarchs when we practice, and we really do get it together. I'm gonna to give the final words tonight um, of my talk back to Yun Men. There was a little poem of his, also from the biographical pages of the Blue Cliff Record. So once again, here's Yun Men. Fundamental reality, fundamental emptiness, one form, one flavor. It's not that a subtle entity does not exist. It is not a matter of hesitating over. Clear and lucid, this contains the whole world. Thank you all for listening.